All right, guys, thanks for showing up on time. There's a material which is really, really important in this chapter, so I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, Rob did some questions, so we're going to have a reading assignment quiz. Hopefully you guys read. So I did not edit her questions at all. So just keep tabs on your own. Some of them are a little bit more wordy than I would make them, but... Okay, look at that, and it'll give you like 15 seconds to read it. Uh, we're going to go over the answers. Process. If you if there's a question and you're like not sure, get in that habit of like marking it, you know, saying, Well, I'm not sure about this one, but I'm going to make a little mark by it. So if I'm done at the end, I'm going to do that. this one's really long. Hopefully, you can all see that. Feels <laughs> <laughs> like Strav, huh? Yeah. She's just Oh, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Like, let's write a treatise on that. Sorry. Is it based on a true one? No. Adam probably be on the bunny hills. Your only friend can only be a bunny Maybe she grew up skiing something in California. This one will take a little bit more time, so I'll give you 30 seconds or so. The pictures are not ideal, but this is very representative of something that you might see um, on a test. So. And again, for the younger users, this would be like a gonioscopic view. This would be obviously more like an ultrasound view or something. <clears throat> We're going to go over these, so let's a few more seconds on this one. one is, um, some of these are shades of gray. Rob and I didn't really talk about these, but, you know, I think it's more important to understand concepts. Hopefully you wouldn't get a shades of gray uh, question. You would get a more black and white question. But this is directly from the book, so. can't read that, come see me for a refraction. <laughs> chapter was really good because there's so much relevant to call. This is like a really good, not only just the book learning, but really relevant stuff for all you guys. This one, the wording is a little bit shades of gray, but I think you can pick the best answer. two answers that are reasonable, but one that's best.
Okay, now this is where the big encyclopedia comes forth. And again, as Rob wrote the well, this one's actually pretty simple, but some of the answers are a little bit longer. So, any questions about this? Limbal vascular injury is more prog poorly prognostic than the other things. We'll talk about this more. Tetra tetracyclines work by depleting calcium, which prevents PMN degranulation. In the acute phase, in the chronic phase of ocular surface disease or injury, you know, there's other effects of tetracycline, um, which we probably know about. Um, we talk about that there's some, you know, vague effect of, on membrane metalloproteinases, which are different than PMN granulation products um, and also the more known effect on just meibomian secretion so there can be more than one effect in the later uh, phases uh, vitamin C you know is something that you would think okay that's a cofactor for collagen synthesis so obviously the other two are pretty self-explanatory um, this one is I don't spend too much time on this, but I've actually seen this in Utah. Somebody coming in with corneal edema due to cold. I've seen it. Um, I think Dr. Katz wrote a little case report on this, actually. Somebody was biking or something, it seems like. But anyway, if you cool down the <laughs> enzymatic process, the, you know, the cellular process, you can inhibit the endothelial pump and get corneal edema. This one, anybody have questions about this or understand this one? What does that one show there? What's that? Angle recession. Okay. If you can see the angle structure, I mean, it's a little hard to tell, as opposed to this one, which shows what? Which one? Yeah, I'm sorry, the pointer is. <laughs> that one's image. Like it looks like it's losing. No. <laughs> Where'd it go? I see it there. But yeah, B, that's supposed to represent sclera that you can see below the angle structure. So that one is cyclodialysis, right? Is this the, basically the ciliary body pulls away from the sclera. And then angle position here, dialysis is the most obvious. Trabecular damage is the, probably the least obvious, but anyway. How many of you have done gonioscopy on a patient? Have most of you done it? Yeah. Any questions about this one? Sickle cell disease, we don't see that much here. No. I mean, just because it's so much more likely to cause blood staining and rapid elevation of pressure escalation within a short period of time, the indications for washout are much more aggressive. And then the other one is obvious, it is pressure is the most important factor. None of those other things are factors. This was the easiest question. What does interpolate mean, Srob? It's in the book, but I'm not even sure. I mean, it, it's a math term, right? Yeah. It's a math term. But they talked about the, yeah, the glaucoma tube thing. I don't know exactly what they're talking about there. But anyway, we know, those of you who've been on trauma call know that you try to tuck uveal tissue back in unless it's grossly dirty or chronic. Infected. Uh, this one, basically, the point is if the pH isn't normal, irrigate more. So, the right answer would have been um, actually, in my opinion, C, even though it says B there. 
you know, B is correct also. But, and it, it, you know, again, this is a gray zone answer because if you haven't irrigated enough, or if there's a particle of cement, there's cement down. Cement would be the most, or grout, or that's a pretty common injury as people get cement splashed in their eye and there'll be some particles down in there and that'll keep you from getting the pH down. So more illustration of the principle. This one, SLET is, we're not really gonna talk about that. But if you have a unilateral burn and healthy stem cells, healthy corneal cells on the other eye, you can use the autologous graft to repopulate the cells. You don't need immunosuppression. There's only one problem with this answer, and that's that if you have aggressive scarring um, from the conjunctiva, you, you really need a barrier to keep those vessels and cells from growing onto the cornea. So often you would combine it with some other type of surgery. Fix the limbus, but so that's the answer. So, can anybody remember what the highlights were of the reading? Any of them? Irrigate. I mean, I don't know why those highlights are there. <laughs> but, you know, the people who write the BCSC are the same people who may be writing test questions and they're going to be referring to BCSC. So, good. You guys remember that. Now, a harder question. What mistake did you find in the text? Actually, I forgot to look on the online version. I have the, I looked at, I found it in the print the most recent print revision, so I don't know that it's been, anybody find a mistake in the text? It's a glaring error. I read it, I cruised through it, and I was like, whoa. What? The CT scan, don't do a metabolic scan. That's exactly right. It's on that table. <laughs> they fixed that. It said, don't do a CT scan if, there's, if you think there's metal in the eye. And then on the bottom of the table, it says the same thing for MRI. So somebody just read. Absolutely. The CT scan is the test of choice, right? If you think there's metal in the eye. Or any foreign body, really. Because you just never know if it's metal. It's really obvious, but why would you not do an MRI if there's iron in the eye? It acts like a little blender blade, and, you know, could, could move, right? One of my friends was a radiologist. And uh, so I did a radiology rotation early in the days of MRI. That's how old I am. You know, and I hated radiology. It was so boring. But he would take his keys and throw it down into the into the magnet, and they would shoot back out. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. So just a quick word about healing. Um, this isn't actually in the material, but I think it's really important is think about your eye and all the structures and one thing that's not addressed at all in this, which is really critical and important is eyelid, you know, and because of the way the BCSC books are, there's a lot of overlap, you know, in, in where things are presented, but the eyelid, if the eyelid is messed up, that is, that is almost a dead end for you know ocular surface disease issues so eyelid scarring from trauma and more importantly from burns chemical and otherwise is probably the most important thing actually but just think how the conjunctiva heals compared to the cornea obviously think about stem cells because those are really maybe not always as resilient as we would like them to be and then the most obvious is the endothelium we know is kind of really pretty delicate. Fortunately, it's internal, so it's pretty protected. But. And then also how healing can be adaptive or maladaptive. And that's a really important thing in the eye because the eye, most parts of our body, you know, we want inflammation, we want <coughs> muscle growth, etc. 
cetera, but obviously the eye, we want the media to stay clear. And we require this very special skin to stay healthy to keep the surface clear. Um, so chemical injuries, um, there's, you know, basically there's two parts to this chapter. There's kind of the chemical and, you know, non-trauma part. Um, and then there's the trauma part. So we'll try to cover both because I think there's a lot of practical stuff. So basically, think of alkaline injuries as kind of melting the cell membranes. Um, and because of that, there's no barrier set up. You just, it just cruises right into the eye once those cell membranes are. So you can really get a lot of damage. And um, that's why irrigation is so important. Have you guys heard of the saying, the solution to pollution is? Pollution. Pollution, right? So, and that, that applies to a lot of things in ophthalmology. It applies to infectious risk because if you're really, you know, decreasing the bacterial count, that you're less likely to get a pathologic response. But it applies really um, specifically to chemical so, you've all been on call, you know, <laughs> you know how that goes, and pH strips are not always accurate. So, whenever there's a doubt, please irrigate more. Have the ED irrigate, or you irrigate, or have the patient irrigate. But, so, this picture just shows some eyelid injury. Um, I'm going to actually go to the book, too, if I can get it to pull up, because I think there are a lot of good pictures in the book. Um, won't spend. Acid injuries tend to be less severe, although this is a picture that one of my fellows found in a previous iteration. This is an acid injury, so you can see it's, sorry this pointer is so dim, there it goes. But you can see there's some limbal blanching, I mean that looks pretty wiped out. So acid injuries, and the book mentions specifically hydrofluoric acid, even though the pH is like 3 or something, because I don't know why that's more likely to penetrate. Um, but generally, acid will coagulate the protein, so you can think of acid as more of a cooking type injury. It'll create some barriers in coagulum, which stops the <coughs> injury anatomically. And like the alkaline injury, which just kind of breaks down the cell membranes and cruises on into the eye. So, if you were called by the ED, which happens all the time, and you, this guy had, you know, an alkaline splash to his eye, eyes, both eyes are injured, what would you do? We've already mentioned some of the things, so what would be the first step, Tina? Yeah, so just, yeah, rinse, irrigate. Yeah, so how do we irrigate? Again, part of this is basic for the more junior people who what would you tell the emergency physician? Yeah. So if they have, a lot of times they use what's called a Morgan lens. Most of you have heard about that. It's just an irrigating contact lens. You put up to the IV bag, you anesthetize the eye, you stick that thing in there, and you just run saline or LR or whatever you have. It doesn't matter if you just irrigate. But if you don't have that, you can just, yeah, you can take bottles of safe. So what what solutions are okay to use? Saline is good, right? Yeah, Anything yes, they yes. have that's in an IV bag. Yeah. What about water? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If you have water, I mean, why well, wash stations are water, right? Yeah. The point is, it doesn't matter. If you have a gallon of milk, uh, honestly, it's like irrigated solution to the pollution is dilution. <laughs> you know, people. <laughs> you're not going to really be in a setting where you're counseling people, hey, get a jug of milk out of your eye. But, <laughs> so yeah, irrigate, then, I mean, usually you have to see the patient, right? And then you assess all the layers. Like this guy is going to be maybe in a big trouble because he has eyelid burns too. You know, he has facial burns. He has some, actually, that, you know, there's some vascular damage, but it doesn't look like some of the pictures we'll look at where they where this is wiped out. So let me see if I can go to the book here. I tried to download it. Um, see if it comes
comes up because there are a lot of good pictures in that book. And I wanted to kind of go through those too. All right. So the tables are useful. I don't know that you're going to get asked about kind of grading on, you know, by a this, but I think if you can look at those, um, this is an alkali burn, but not, you can see there's a lot of clear cornea there, um, you know, even there's a little bit of limbal blanching, but it's more of a sectoral burn. Um, <clears throat> that one, the cornea looks awful, right? And maybe there's some limbal blanching here, um, but it can be worse. Um, this one shows, a lot of times you'll see sectoral burns, and where would you, I mean, you guys have seen these patients probably, stuff splashes in the bottom of the eye, right, gravity. So it's very common to see kind of inferior conjunctiva, and bearing of the upper part. And generally, the particles that you're looking for would be in the inferior fornix. And especially, again, I, the one that I've seen really commonly is, I mean, you see a lot of ammonia and alkali burns, you know, even, uh, um, sodium hydroxide cleaner type burns. Those are a little bit different, but a lot of the kind of construction burns tend to be mortar or cement or whatever. You think, yeah, oh, that's not that bad, but those are very alkali kind of splash injuries tend to get the lower part. So this is just demonstrating that bad limbal ischemia, a lot of whitening. Um, nasty looking, really bad one here. And so what it says in the book, but what do you think, those are, those are sutures. What, what's going on on this eye? It doesn't say in the caption, but what's been done to that eye? Maddie. Yeah, there's amniotic membrane that's been sutured on that eye. If you don't manage things well, or even if you do, sometimes you end up with this. So that goes back to my comment about healing and just, you know, kind of the body says, hey, I'm injured. I'm going to bring in the troops, vascular tissue, scar tissue, and I, you know, save the eye. Body says, yeah, I could see. And that ain't too easy to fix right there. So that's what you're trying to avoid. But it could be worse, right? What if they get an infection and they perforate and they get endophthalmitis and they lose their eye? So, so kind of the approach to a lot of things is what's the worst thing that can happen? What can I do to make it be the best? And then usually there's kind of middle ground. Um, so then we kind of go more to there's some acid burns there. And you can kind of see a little bit of a you know, much clearer, um, almost this kind of coagulated edge, which is, you know, usually more of a barrier function. But acid burns can look really bad too. And this is an older, I'm sure this is many, many months or even years out from an acid burn. So they can turn out really bad too. This is another picture of, this says some blepharon. Um, I don't know if it's really some blepharon or not. I don't think it is actually. I think it might be fibrin. But anyway, whatever it is, you can see the deeper structures. The cornea isn't horribly trashed. The limbus doesn't look great. But this is the kind of question you'll get on a board's, world boards question. They'll say, okay, what do you see? What do you think it is? What's the differential? How would you treat it? Just going through a lot of pictures are good. And I, I'm impressed with the current version of the BCSC. They have a lot of good pictures. Most of these pictures are just from clinicians. These are like people I know who submit their pictures and say, yeah, I've got a good picture of that. So, so it's fairly real life now, which is good. And I don't know that you use um, paper clips too much, but you can you can make a little retractor from a paper clip if you needed to. 
in an emergency setting. But the idea is to, I mean, the patient's going to be in pain, be squeezing. You know, in the ED setting, it might even be appropriate to have them get some sedation. And really, you know, you've got to get the you know, routine material out there and out of there, and you really need to uh, kind of clean things up. And it's not inappropriate to go to the OR if you have something like a really bad fireworks injury where, um, unfortunately, like a Roman candle or something, where not only is there a thermal burn, but you may have some chemical magnesium or something that's deposited in there, and you just you can't get that out in the, in the emergency room. Um, foreign bodies, etc. So we're going to switch to trauma now here. So if, any questions about that? Oh, thermal. I'm going to talk a little bit about thermal burns, too, because I think that's important for call and what you guys do. Might have to get my reading glasses out. Okay. So we talked about most of this stuff in terms of just the really acute first stage treatment, but then um, we use steroids topically to prevent inflammation. We don't want an overly aggressive inflammatory response because we don't want all those blood vessels and scar tissue to form. Um, Preservative-free medicines to the extent possible. We have the luxury here of having an awesome pharmacy. It'll mix up preservative-free dexamethasone if you need, including the inpatient pharmacy will do that. If you want something strong that's preservative-free, and then I know Maddie knows this, and some of you know this, but what's another really good steroid that's preservative free? There's act that's commercially available. Anybody know of? I mean, most eye drops have preservatives, right? And why would you not want preservatives in an injured eye? Yeah, because any little extra chemical may impair the epithelial healing. That's really what you really want to promote. Re-epithelialization, that is like super, super important, right? You gotta get that barrier re-established or the body's gonna freak out and bring in blood vessels and start to change. So low to prednol ointment, low to max ointment, we use that in the ICU of burn unit a lot. It's kind of expensive, but it's truly preservative-free, medium strength steroid. So put that in your little call book, you know, low to max ointment, lubricates, medium strength steroid, pretty much for a you know big time injury patient who's going to be in the burn unit or the ICU who cares you know it's a one ten millionth of their total bill use a good expensive drug but preservative free dexamethasone is 0.1 percent and it's cheap formulated in the hospital um, we t sodium citrate drops I think do actually Work and our pharmacy will make those up. And it's a similar thing as the tetracycline to deplete calcium. And actually, I think if you look in the literature, you may see actually ascorbate drops too used. So vitamin C, promote collagen synthesis, supporting the epithelium, um, tarsorophy, not in the very acute phase, but you know. The pH is normalized, we're calming inflammation, but the epithelium's not healing. Don't forget about torsorphy. Incredibly helpful. Can be done at the bedside. Bandage conduct lens are often appropriate. EMT or amniotic membrane. It's one of the best and most important uses for things like Opera's, which are kind of expensive and overused. I mean, their use is promoted for dry eye and you know, stuff like that, which is kind of ridiculous. But when you have a burn patient, Procara or some of the other dry amniotic membrane products, or you can use frozen amniotic membrane, super, super helpful. Um, helps support the surface, has a bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. And then there are different kinds of limbal transplantation, which are 
um, later in the stage, but can be got, can be done in kind of the intermediate stage as well. Um, and sometimes it's better to go a little bit earlier than too late um, because if you get that, you may remember that really nasty looking vascularized eye. Sometimes it's better to try to prevent that before it gets to that stage. So OSR just stands for Ocular Surface Reconstruction. I think Dr. Lynn gives a lecture on that, so I won't go a lot into that. SLET is Simple Wimble Epithelial Transplantation, and uh, kind of beyond you know, going into the detail. But basically, you take a small area of limbus from the normal eye, snip it up into tiny little pieces, try to glue it onto the cornea with the amniotic membrane over or on top or both, and then a bandage contact lens. It actually works. It's amazing. You don't need immunosuppression other than just you know moderate topical steroids because it's the patient's own cells. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, keratoprosthesis would be you know kind of the option of last resort. Uh, for cornea transplants to work, and I think I think it might even be next or two Tuesdays from now. I'm going to talk to you about cornea transplant, so we can talk a little bit more about what you have to do to make a cornea transplant work. Obviously, if the ocular surface and the adnexa are not in good shape, then a cornea transplant's not gonna work. And that's really the main issues with these patients. It's like getting the ocular surface, the eyelid, et cetera, healthy enough to support uh, a healthy cornea transplant. Um, so thermal burns, um, it's not really, talked about too much in the book, although there is that picture of the cigarette burn. I can just imagine that, you know, some torture guy going, <laughs> with Tom Cruise's eye, right? Uh, but uh, you'll see these patients in the burn unit here. You know, we get patients from everywhere. You're going to see facial burns and eye burns and there are tough patients. And again, I just want to remind you that managing the eyelid and I tell the fellows this all the time. As junior residents and even chiefs, you, you should not be making the calls on these patients. It's okay to see them, you know, the first couple of days, whatever. You need to get these patients staffed by cornea attendings. And even the fellows, it, it, it's like high stakes stuff. So you, and plastics too. You need to get plastics involved really soon. And even if, you know, facial plastics and stuff is there, you need to get oculoplastics to see these patients with you. And there are enough attendings, you can usually find somebody in clinic, you can go over at lunchtime and just at least make sure you're on the right track. Because again, sometimes they need lid surgery, sometimes they need amnio temporary. You, know, you just need some experience to help you sort out. Because sometimes it's hard to tell, like, is it really staining or is it just kind of sick epithelium or is there a lot of mucus there that's staining? You just need somebody with some experience and some authority to make these tough calls about how these patients are doing because the implications can be really big, you know, blindness or not blindness. So that's my pearl there. Roman candles are one of the horrible, horrible things that I've seen where people, you know, teenage boys in general have Roman candle fights. Does everybody know what a Roman candle is? It shoots out a fiery ball of phosphorus and magnesium and and you know, people shoot them at each other and occasionally somebody gets shot in the eye and then of course what do they do? They slam their eye shut so they put all this fireworks stuff in there cooking their eye and literally get pink globe left on and it's just horrible. I mean they're often unrepairable. So and fireworks, I mean our job is to be um, good emissaries of eye protection and I don't know if you can do a lot about stupidity but but anyway, burns are, thermal burns are more similar to acid burns, just depending on how serious they are. And more, I, I would say the more kind of related problem is the eyelid often gets burned. And, and you'll get cicatrizing changes of the eyelid and you'll get last malposition. <coughs> and exposure, so. But burn, you know, thermal, injuries tend to coagulate the tissue a little bit too. So the treatment paradigm is basically the same except just be a little bit more cognizant of eyelid stuff. Um, it's pretty much
much the same In terms of antibiotics, what do you guys think would be a good antibiotic regimen for a chemical burn or a thermal burn with a corneal or conjunctival epithelial defect? What would you use? Yeah, moxifloxacin is preservative free. We like that, right? It's broad spectrum. But you could start with erythromycin or macitracin. You want it, you want something general or gentle if you know that they're not infected. I wouldn't recommend gentamicin or tobramycin or you know something that may be a little bit more harsh. Um, this is somewhat repetitive based on what we talked about with chemical injuries. So the cruise on trauma. Um, we have the cold-related corneal edema that the quiz talked about, but then there you can actually also freeze your cornea, which can permanently damage the endothelial cells, so just know that. Um, I put in there eye banking because occasionally as an eye banker we get tissue that is damaged because it's when it's uh, packaged in ice for trend, uh, you know, whatever we call it, delivery, it'll be too close to the ice and the tissue will freeze and it will kill the We use cryo a lot, right, to kill kill cells. We use it a lot in ophthalmology. The retina doctors use it to create scar tissue in the retina. Um, anterior segment surgeons we use it to kill cells. I'm not sure from a few weeks ago where we killed neoplastic cells with cryo. Um, ionizing and UV radiation cause, you know, I think more of the acute is what we would be interested in, but it. Has anyone in here actually seen UV um, keratopathy? Um, it looks exactly like that. An intrapalpebral trashing of the epithelium. Just, you know, basically really bad punctate keratitis. But this apparently is a picture of ionizing radiation exposure. Or no, no, this was UV in the next one. I took that one out, but anyway. So, supportive treatment, usually in a couple days are fine. Teach them to wear sunglasses. Um, this is one that's not in the book, but I think is really, really important, and it get, gets back to the question about avoiding toxic medications. You're going to learn about all this stuff in glaucoma. You're going to see patients that are on four, four drops all the time, and their cornea looks like heck, and they're 2200, and you're like, what? I mean, just think, with, when you, if you're thinking about ocular surface, with, to the extent you can, withdraw and simplify. Benzalkonium chloride in particular, which is, you know, preservative, it's in a lot of eye drops, there are some neuropreservatives, hard on the epithelium. And there can be a synergistic effect of the preservative and toxic medications. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors tend to be pretty hard on the epithelium. Certain um, antibiotics like tobramycin, gentamicin, tend to be hard on the surface. And you add a bunch of stuff into an old person, you know, I mean, you've guys, you've seen these guys at the VA, right? Like, oh my gosh, you can't see, and his epithelium looks horrible. And so you look for, you know, some things that could tell you, hey, maybe this is toxicity. You'll see this, the epithelium is trying to mature, and you get this whirl or kind of hurricane pattern, and that's actually the normal maturation. But when the cells are cloudy, you can actually say, Wow, you know, this is like I'm probably affecting the stem cells or something, and I'm getting these cloudy cells instead of nice smooth cells. You'll see this kind of not necessarily true staining, but just sick looking epithelium. So, and it can affect the conjunctiva too. And with chronic um, use, medications can really damage the ocular surface permanently. So, that's something to remember. It's actually not even in the ECSC book, but it's super important for clinical practice. And then, um, I don't think this was in there either, but you can get, we actually saw a patient recently, Maddie, did you see that patient? We saw a patient with, yeah, I think you did, with probably glaucoma drop induced pemphigoid changes on her conjunctiva, and look very similar to this actually. And then again, I think the blistering disease talk Talk, but just know that you can get chronic scarring from the 
use coming out of the VA right now um, as well. Um, we're going to, so the proposed plan is to do a biopsy, but the biopsy is going to look the same as ocular cicatricial. Yeah, I mean, just look at the unilaterality of it. yeah, is it's tough, you know. I mean, it's basically drug induced is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. You okay. have to look for other systemic disease, you have to correlate, but yeah, age, you know, I think it's much more likely to see what's presumed drug induced cicatricial conjunctivitis in older patients. And you know, if it's in a younger, you have to assume that it's really bad you know, blistering disease, systemic kind of thing, until proven otherwise. Like this patient we saw, I'd seen her in like 2014, pretty much documented the same things, you know. And she kind of shows back up five years later, Dr. Chorkoff sent her to me. I think it's probably her drops, but we're gonna send her to Durham. I mean, they have better and better blood tests and things, yeah. and, and most of the time it's better, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but it's better to biopsy somewhere other than the conjunctiva because <clears throat> that's pretty high stakes. You know, if you induce more scarring, you can cause worsening seal problems. It's probably better to biopsy the mouth or something like that. So dermatology is amazing here. You know, they're the ones who take care of the blistering diseases. So always get a derm consult here. It could be different in different ways. The trauma, uh, this also is really important kind of call and just clinical care uh, topic for you guys. Um, you know, think about, always think about these patients, you know, with the different layers of the eye and what's going on. When you're overwhelmed and you're a younger doctor, just go back to your, you know, okay, I'm just gonna do my basic eye exam. Ema, we can talk about specifics of management. I think you've all probably managed hyphemas, but there's, there may be some controversial or questions with regard to management. So, um, so what would you guys do if you saw this patient in the ED? I'm sorry, it's kind of an out of focus picture, but so what would be some important clinical things to determine. Some of this is super obvious, but I am the, yeah, so a lot of emphasis on pressure, right? Because you want to avoid what? Yeah. And, um, but also just all the basic trauma stuff, right? What's their vision? You know, is there any chance that there's a foreign body in the eye? Do they need a CT? Are you going to get an ultrasound at some point? <coughs> Who's going to manage them? Are they a kid? Are they an adult? So a lot of it's just really practical and common sense. How often are you going to see them? Where do they live? You know, can you keep them still, et cetera. So we know most of the stuff for hyphema management, which kind of changes a little bit. Um, not much emphasis at all um, and not much evidence to support any kind of systemic treatment but we pretty much always use cycloplegics, right? Cycloplegic like or even is appropriate. We pretty much always use topical steroids, you know, but really common regimen would be like prednisolone acetate, 1% four times a day. Uh, we pretty much always prescribe rest. How often you should you see a hyphema patient? Yeah, probably daily if you can. I mean, when, when is re-bleeding? most likely to happen after what period, what window of time? Yeah, it's so about three to seven days. So, so you know, if they're kind of, I mean, educating your patient is really important. Does that mean you need to see a patient every day for seven days? The answer is no. What's gonna happen to this eye? This eye has a lot of stirred up blood. What's gonna happen if they're really compliant with their rest and they sleep with their head up, you know, and they're still, it's gonna layer out, right? So then you can see more, you can figure more out. Um, but this is what you want to avoid. And um, just, I don't know that you ha absolutely have to memorize the, you know, the sickle patient on 25, 24 hours is all you have. I'm not sure that that's all that important. <coughs> just knows that higher the pressure, the longer and 
then there are risk factors like sickle cell, more likely to be that um, So what would you do if you felt like this were, well this patient already has blood seeing and that's very characteristic, it looks golden, you know, kind of looks like golden, that's very opaque, you can't see through it. But what would you do to minimize, that's a really obvious question too, what, what, what do you do if you think they're getting blood seeing? Has anyone ever done that? Or mm -hmm. seen it done? Okay. So, if you're going to take them to surgery, I think the most important thing is don't screw the eye up worse than it already is. So what do you think some of the risks would be? It's on there, but you can't see in the eye, right? You know, jabbing sharp things in it. What if their lens is forward? What if they have an intumescent lens? I mean, you know, what if you're if their decimase membrane is detached and you you squirt viscose in there and completely detach their decimase. So you got to be careful. Hopefully you'll intervene before while there's a little bit of a view. So what can you do to get a view? Maddie, do you manage to hyphema surgically? So take them to the OR. You're not going to do this under topical anesthesia. You can block them or do general if it's kid or whatever. So make a little stab incision carefully. Stay pretty flat. What's going to happen? Blood's going to start coming out, right? You might want to irrigate with a little BSS. But then you can put OVD in there. And generally, you use Fisco. And you can kind of get a view usually. You can push the clot aside or get a view. And then um, you can either, you know, the book says you can just irrigate and but most of the time you'll make two incisions, you'll flush fluid through, um, and again, this is more for the more senior, you know, kind of getting into surgery people, but um, bimanual IAA is awesome because, you know, those are kind of blunt tips. You can kind of keep them way peripheral. Um, if you have a really um, dense cloth that isn't coming out, you can use the, the tractor. There's some space, put more OBD in, but um, it's important to know how to do that if you're in general practice or whatever. Um, so you can, if you don't have any of that fancy equipment, you can just make a little bit bigger limbal incision and just take the BSS 19 gauge cannula, the one that's on the bottle, and just kind of push on it and irrigate, let blood out. <clears throat> So we're going to talk more about the penetrating or perforating trauma, but just a quick little, um, you know, this is in the book, and I think it's this is a really common call thing, right? You're going to see foreign bodies and retained stuff in the eye on call, and remember to look underneath the lid, flip the lid, um, rust rings. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Rust rings and abrasions, just because it's important clinically. Um, so, little abrasions, can you patch or not patch? Or if you're getting the usual Instacare call, the 15th time when you're trying to take care of five people, you want to get a little abrasion done. You know, this is a PA at Instacare. What's the vision? I have no idea. <laughs> Tell you no. I have no idea. Yeah. You want to see this patient? No, it's a corneal abrasion. You take care of it. But so so, what what would be an ex, what's kind of the extremes? I'm just going to tell you because we're running out of time. Patching is fine. Erythromycin ointment and a patch is okay. That's fine. There's some th stuff in the literature about patching, not patching. Basically, you want to manage their pain. So, quick word about pain management. And this again is us being doing our job to educate our peers. I would say it is never, ever, ever appropriate, never, never, ever, ever by any ophthalmologist even, and that would be argued by some, but certainly not by any emergency doctors or personnel <clears throat> to prescribe anesthetics or give anesthetics. It's just wrong. It's it, the complication. The risk-benefit ratio is just bad. It's malpractice, and you need to educate your about that. And you see ED doctors do it all the time. And there's some stuff in the emergency literature. Yeah, I've had lots of arguments with ED doctors. Yeah.
yeah. help us. And yeah. sometimes they go ahead and do it even though we're yeah. them not to. Yeah. Um, the question is like, Get your attending involved. You know, that's all you can do. Because, you know, they're not going to really take it for us. And we strongly urge, you know, that is not the best way to treat this patient. But there's such a negative stigma um, for using strong pain meds now. You can understand, I mean, it's not completely stupid to think about something else. It's just, you know, what if they don't follow up? You, you, you know, it's just that what if. <clears throat> but it's just the what ifs, you know. NSAIDs are almost as bad, actually. NSAIDs are way overutilized in the emergency system. And it's also the what ifs. NSAIDs are pretty effective for abrasion patients. I mean, if you have a super compliant patient and you want to give them something to help their pain, it's a reasonable thing to add to your regimen. But the problem is they don't show up, they stay on it forever. You can get a corneal melt from an NSAID literally in days. Literally in days. If you have an MP defect and it's it's kind of this, you know, probably shunting things into an alternate prostaglandin slash whatever inhibition inhibition pathway where you kind of promote melting instead of, you know, pain control or whatever. But you guys can look that up. You can just do it. PubMed search on corneal melts and NSAIDs, and you'll, you'll find a lot of stuff. In general, if you're going to use an NSAID, if they're on a corticosteroid, it's better than if they're on an NSAID alone. So just know that. Probably, again, has something to do with kind of general suppression of inflammation and not shunting inflammatory, you know, chemicals or cytokines or whatever into the, say, the system that says, oh, collagenase. Um, rust rings, also really important. Probably not <coughs> even a first year procedure. Um, honestly, if it's central, um, sometimes it's better not to grind out a rust ring, honestly. So, not really going to go into that too much, but um, there can be huge implications for metallic foreign bodies near the visual axis. If you are going to take one out, make sure you get a good inflammation. So, um, and sometimes it's better to let it fester for a day or two and punt to somebody who's going to get sued instead of you. Okay? Because a lot of times when you let them fester for a few days and you have them on an antibiotic and steroid, they'll come out a lot easier. I mean, there's a balance there because you don't want to say, okay, it's going to scar if it's inflamed, they're going to be more comfortable. But just know that you need backup on a, a metallic form body or other process on the cornea that's near the visual axis. Send it up the chain of command a little bit. No need to. Now, sometimes you'll see metal stuck on the eye and there's no rust right there. You say, I'm having a necessary and new and you won't put the metal out. That's fine. I'm talking about rust rings. Okay? Get the metal out. Don't be overly aggressive with your burr. Okay, so trauma. Unfortunately, you've all seen chemosis and squashed eyes and peaking of the pupil towards a rupture site. Um, the imaging thing I wanted to clarify, when in doubt, get a CT scan. Um, we've had a, um, a, there's a litigation patient settled in our system about 15 years ago where the PGY4 resident happened to think they were good at ultrasound and did an ultrasound on the patient and didn't get a CT and there was a metallic foreign body and the patient showed up with siderosis nine months later. So ultrasound is going to miss some things and you know we almost never do that but just don't be falsely, even Dr. Harry could miss something on ultrasound. You need to get a CT scan anything at all get in the eye just get the CT scan <clears throat> um, so quickly there's a lot of stuff in the book which is good you know little diagrams of how to tuck tissue in etc but I want to this is more for the chiefs because you're going to be doing traumas and you know the second current second years at the end of the year you're going to be doing trauma so and the little bit of time that we have left 
in just a couple minutes. Um, I won't ask you the question because I need to give you the answer just based on time. The book says, oh, don't make the sutures too tight because you're going to flatten the cornea excessively. Who the freak cares? I mean, get the dang thing closed. Make the sutures long and tight. And we've all, anybody who's done a ruptured glove, you know, you put in a suture and then you, you think you've got it kind of tight and then you put in the adjacent sutures and it's still leaking and then the, your first sutures are loose. Long and tight. This, is, this looks awesome. I love it when I see that. It looks like one of those little coin purses that they used to have. You know, it's, a little, it's just like imbricated. That's what you want it to look like. I, this came up recently with Maddie. When you guys, when you get a bad trauma and you're going to the main OR, sometimes you have to take the lens out. They should roll the FACO machine, FACO vitrectomy machine. A lot of times they don't take it over there. So you might have this very obvious lens rupture with blood in the engine. So you're going to close the laceration first. But then what happens if you leave the lens in there? We've all seen that, right? It happens all the time. Then you have this bloody white mess you can't see through. You're trying to figure out from ultrasound what's going on. Sometimes you got to take the lens out. You're going to have to again, align your superiors to make that decision. But what you guys can do is make sure you're prepared when you go to the first and second years. Um, what about anesthesia? The book doesn't even say this, but general anesthesia, right? But what is the second really, really important? You need to paralyze the patient. How many times do we put people in the general, quote general, LMA, or running something in the infusion? The patient needs to be paralyzed because if they start to get light and squeeze, eye guts may come out. You don't want that. You need to be paralyzed. Make sure your anesthetist knows you want them paralyzed. Estimate how long you think the case is going to be. They need to be paralyzed. Uh, other causes of injury. Iatrogenic injury, including phaco burns, I think is covered in the cataract lectures. But um, So, the book is good. Read the, look at the pictures and read, you know, the tables and diagrams about trauma. I wanted to go through that, but I don't have enough time. This really should be two lectures. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you guys is, this is a, an okay format from the presenter's view. It's been a long time since I was in the learner chair. But lectures obviously are, everybody's kind of learning different things and you're, you know, you may have conflicts that you need to be to. So, and, and you know, I think there's been a little bit of talk about doing this, but I, I just was wondering whether more of a modular system where you guys can go in and, I mean, we have our Moran intranet, you know, we have, some lectures, but I think if we really went through and made it a little bit more interactive with some questions and stuff, that might be a good a good way to do it. I, I think the cornea faculty, we would be willing to do that. It would take a year or more to really kind of get everything set up. I mean, I think it's good to come here, but you know, people need to leave, they need to go other places. Um, but then, as an adjunct to that, I think it might be better to have clinical conferences where we say, okay, modular learning for lecture, you know, do your lecture, maybe some quizzes or whatever, but then have clinical conferences. Because if you can imagine, if you had like a clinical conference with people bringing cases or whatever, and you talked about some of this kind of stuff, then it, that would be a really good learning experience, I think. And we, I think the attendings could offer more. Because what we can offer is our experience, the stuff that's not in the basic science book. There's just too much to cover. I mean, you cannot cover the learning of the plot in a few months. I don't know. Think about it. Yeah. I mean, we can just do it because, you know, I've been hearing while we're working on it, and not, this isn't anything, this isn't, shouldn't be on residents. This should be on. Dr. Petty's going to talk to you about that more, but yes, we want to do it. Yeah, and we're I think we'll do it. That I, think, well. yeah. I think because the cornea faculty, like, this was a weird year because Elaine or somebody just flipped a coin and we all got lectures we haven't done before in a long time. But it would be a good time to just pool our 
everything. You know, we're fairly small and you know, we can work together and just try to cover everything. Good, good things that are in the repository. And then I would rather see us spend time doing like clinical conferences personally and just say, okay, we're gonna cover this topic, but let's talk about clinical things. And then we have, you know, videos take a long time. You, if, you, if you're showing a bunch of little, you know, 30 second video clips, you can't, you can't even finish a lecture like this. But obviously if you had a clinical conference, you can, you can do that. So that's just my feeling. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being here on time. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for taking care of our patients Thank you. on the call. So